guys, welcome back to Genomics with Georgia. This is Georgia and this is the channel where I share with you everything I'm learning in my journey working in biology driven data science. On today's episode, we're going to be discussing the new tools and technologies I've been using in my new job that I started a couple months back because as we all know, different institutes and different companies and even different teams work very, very differently. So I'm going to share the brand new shiny things I've been using in my latest position. And if you're new here, hi, I'm Georgia and I've been working in biology data science roles for the past five years. I've worked in different domains, in different institutions, and I share on this channel everything I'm learning in my career journey. I recently started a new job, so this is the reason this video is happening today. I'm based in Cambridge in the UK and I work in London. So the first new tool that's come across my radar is Quarto. Now I hadn't even heard of Quarto, which actually blows my mind because it's so deeply ingrained in the team that I'm in. So Quarto is a language that was created by the guys over at R, but it's a language that is also able to be used within the ecosystems of Python 2, and it's essentially a language to write reports. So I've never really had to write many reports in my previous roles, which is actually hilarious when I think about it. If I needed to share my analysis, then I would be working in a GitHub repository with other data scientists, or I would be kind of doing things on the fly and sharing things in slideshows with other colleagues. I've never had to generate a code report before. So Markdown is I've actually done a video on Markdown, which I'll try and link up below, but it's up below, link up there. But Markdown is essentially a language that we use to write text to communicate our code to other people. So whether that's fellow coders or whether that's someone who's a non-coder, Markdown is just a language we use to write text and description out. And it's very, very important that we document what we're doing with our code. So what Quarto does, which is really nice, is it wraps all your code up and it means that you can publish your report. So so whether it's a slideshow or whether it's a actual kind of web HTML report, you can run Quarto and Quarto will then run all of your code for you and produce the plot. So it's super reproducible because the Quarto report is running the code. So it's not like you just share a plot with someone, like the report runs your code, make sure it runs properly and then publishes the report. So it's a really, really useful tool and you can create really beautiful reports like I made my first quarto report the other day and it just it looked like so damn professional and I was like I can't believe I've been sleeping on this for so long so you can do quarto reports by writing in quarto markdown or what you can do is have multiple Jupyter notebooks and then each one then becomes like a web page in your quarto report and then it just looks super super smart and yeah I didn't realize that this was a tool that I would need to know so not only am I writing my own reports in Quarto, I'm also kind of debugging pipelines that are running Quarto code. So it's been a really useful tool to learn. Um, and I've said this before, but obviously all bioinformatics jobs are different, all teams are different, so don't run off and learn everything I'm talking about today, but I'm just highlighting um, what I've found new in my new team. So, and number two, uh, the next thing I've been using in my bioinformatics toolbox is the R language. Um, so I said in my kind of 2025 learning bioinformatics video that learning R and being bilingual, okay, might be a good idea. And I know I've been a key advocate of learn Python and learn Python first. I still stand by it. And even like teams and places in academia are like transitioning into more Python coding. So like, I still fully support learning Python first. However, as someone now working back in the kind of transcriptomics world and someone dealing with lots of different data types, I've come to realize, and maybe I've come to accept that I can't avoid R any longer. And there are some bioinformatics tools that are written in R and they're just in R and everyone just accepts that that's the way of doing things. And there are some Python versions of some stuff, but then also some of the really kind of core fundamental packages are in R for a lot of transcriptomic stuff. So it's 
I've been learning R and it's actually been quite an interesting one. I think I'm going to make a whole video about my experience learning R again because it was so nice to feel like a novice and not understand. Um, so learning R has actually been something I've had to do in this new job and I think being bilingual is just the way that you need to be in terms of R and Python. So you've got tools in both technologies that you might need to use. However, you'll always have like your predominant language. So my analysis and my general coding is all in Python, but then I might need to use a certain tool in R. So I need to then convert my data into the format that R wants to receive and then run a tool in R and be able to wrangle that data in R in terms of that tool I might need to be running. So I don't think I need to become super proficient in R and I don't think I'll use it by choice, but I have had to become good enough to use our tools effectively and know what the code is doing and be able to read it and debug it. So that's been, it's been interesting um, and kind of against the brand, but now the brand has become bilingual, everyone. <laughs> So the third shiny tool I've been using in my new role is more to do with the way I've been working. So in previous places, well, my first job, for instance, we would work on Jupyter Notebooks hosted on a kind of job on the compute cluster and really loved working that way, which is always kind of spinning up a job and then that job would launch a Jupyter Notebook. And I never really did any development of pipelines and large bits of coding. It was all notebooks analysis. So that worked completely fine for me. And then in my second role, I was doing more pipeline development, but I was doing it all locally on my machine in PyCharm, which is like a really nice Python based IDE. I highly recommend PyCharm if you're first learning Python because it's got a load of built-in functionality to help you learn how to use Python more effectively and it's got loads of debugging things and just very very good IDE. However, oh and then also yeah in my previous job I would also have some Jupyter Notebooks that I'd run up on the compute cluster. But in my new role, and actually literally on day one of my new role someone had written how to do something and I was like that is exactly how I want to work. So in my new role I am using VS Code and I did mention I kind of started doing a bit of VS Code in my previous role but it was more locally coding not coding on a compute cluster. So I'm now using VS Code and through VS Code you can actually SSH or tunnel into another computer. So I'm sat on VS Code on my laptop but then I then tunnel using SSH into my Institute's computer and then I can access all of my files on the big compute cluster on my nice VS Code interface and it's just been so so good being able to like move around the compute cluster at work with my nice VS Code interface and VS Code obviously supports notebooks so I can write my nice Jupyter notebooks in VS Code but then I can also do kind of Python pipeline development in there you can do your next flow development I've even been writing R scripts like I'm feeling like I'm becoming um a more well-rounded coder now, but yeah, I'm basically using VS Code to tunnel into the compute clusters at work. It's just been a really great way of working and I really like it. And I can connect to my Conda environments that I've got on the HPC at work. It's just really seamless, really nice, and I can't believe I've never done this before. So if you didn't know, you can SSH into another system using VS Code. And if you don't know what SSH is, I don't have the bandwidth to describe it in this video. Maybe we'll do another one, but definitely search that up because you'll need to know it at some point. And next up, point number four. So another tool that I've added to my toolbox in this new position and just generally in 2025 is I'm using AI a lot more in my coding and in my job. So first of all, just to preface, some companies, so especially private companies, you aren't really allowed to use things like ChatGPT because the information is private and you're not supposed to give it to ChatGPT because everything that you give to ChatGPT is used as training data. So very, very important that some places won't allow you to use public tools like ChatGPT, but they will, however, have their own LLM built in-house that 
you can use. So don't think you wouldn't be able to use any AI tools if you were like working in industry. However, I'm rambling. I've been using ChatGPT and GitHub Copilot like every day now. And I kind of can't believe I wasn't really using these properly. So actually two years ago, I was at a hackathon and one of the mentors was like, if, like put your hand up if you're using ChatGPT, and I like proudly kept my hands down you know I was like yeah no I'm, I'm not using that to code and then he was like you're basically a mug if you're not using it at this point and I think it's so true because I think there are so many simple things that take like a little bit of time and ChatGPT can just do them all much more quickly and then it means that if you're saving like a fraction of time on all these little bits then your productivity is just way way higher if you're able to save those little bits of time so I've been using ChatGPT mainly when I've been trying to understand R code so I've been running some pipelines in R I didn't know what they meant so I'd kind of put little bits of it into ChatGPT and say, please, can you explain to me what this bit of code is doing? And then it would walk me through what the code was doing, which was like so helpful when you don't initially have the language to ask about certain things in certain coding languages. So that was really cool. In VS Code, you can have a plugin for GitHub Copilot and it's literally epic, like you'll be coding and then it suggests you to complete your code. And it's just, been such a game changer because I'll be like even just writing out really boring stuff like you've got a really long file path that you need to write and it knows what file you're talking about so you can just tab complete a file it's just been a game changer this year and then also there's just been a few occasions where like I know what I want to do but I can't be bothered to like write out an entire function to do it so I'll have like tested bits and then I'll be like oh ChatGPT can you wrap this in a function for me so I can import this and parameterize this and then it just does it and then you just double check that you agree with what it said and then bosh like everything's just so much easier so yeah I highly highly recommend using AI tools as much as you can but the only thing I'm gonna like oh I forget that this focus thing <laughs> The only thing I'm really going to stress though, and this is coming from someone who's just been learning a new language, it can be very, very easy to just let AI tools code for you. And they are tools and they are assistants, like don't let them do your job for you. And not because I'm scared AI is going to take my role, because you're not going to learn if you just let it do all the work. So there are a few times where I got it to do something in R for me and then I just let it run and then I was like, hold on a minute, I actually need to know and learn what it's spat out for me. Even like, um, I need it to wrangle this thing in some data, then I need to know what bit of the data structure it was accessing and how I'd access that another time. Use it sensibly and use it as a tool for your learning. Very important. And finally, another tool that I have been using in my new bioinformatics position is a lot more databases. So I I think if you'd be interested, I will make a whole video on handy databases in bioinformatics because I've like heard bits and bobs about handy databases, but I really feel like now I'm learning and understanding which databases are available to me and what might be helpful. So beforehand, databases i just didn't really interact with with databases and again every job is different it's not like they were never there it was just my job didn't require me using them before so i mean even if, even at my job at sang it did i ever use a database like a biological database i don't know um Databases, I'm using databases a lot more now and that's because I'm having to do a lot of tasks where I need to compare my data to the global idea of what that is in biology. So I've been doing a lot of analysis of pathways. So I might have a bunch of genes from an RNA-seq experiment. Some are upregulated, some are downregulated. And once you've got all the significant ones, you wanna turn that list of genes actually into something that makes sense to the biologist. So what, what pathways are actually affected by those genes? And yeah, you could use your brain and think about it, or you could plug that gene list into a database and that database would then tell you which genes are enriched in the pathways that it's given you. So you've got the msigdb, which basically has 
all of the different collections across human and mouse and then the different kind of sub collections within those so I hadn't even heard of msigdb before and yet it seems like a very important and fundamental resource for pathway enrichment another database world I've been getting used to is the single cell expression database world so I was kind of aware of the atlas system before in my previous role but I've been using it a little bit more now so in single cell analysis you want to kind of phenotype your cells and figure out what cells you have in your experiment or what cells are in certain different systems and then once you might have your own experiment in order to like figure out what your cells are if you can compare them against a reference data set then you're more confidently able to say oh well this is definitely a myeloid cell or this is definitely a neuron if you can compare it to like a validated set of neurons or myeloid cells or whatever. Databases like this exist and they're really great. So you've got the Human Cell Atlas, which has a bunch of very, very key validated uh, massive data sets of single cell references. And then you've also got the CCI, um, yeah, the Chan Zuckerberg Institute single cell gene atlas thing and they have like a huge collection of single cell experiments and these cells have phenotypes and yeah you can just use them in your analysis. Databases are key for any bioinformatician and I'll jump into a bunch more another time. Okay team, so that was a few new things I've been learning and using in my latest bioinformatics role. Isn't it so cool that like I've been working for five years and yet there are still some really really key things that I hadn't even heard of that are really important to my current position but then equally might not be being used in loads of other bioinformatics roles so this field is so varied and that's why I love it because there's always so much to learn and you're never going to be an expert across everything but just knowing kind of things that could help you out to get your work done can be useful so thanks so much for joining me on this video if you've got any suggestions of things that you might find helpful from me feel free to put them in the comments below and i'll see you again on another video bye